some of our podcasts are much more popular than the others and this special two part conversation is going to be just like that the podcast where we featured adventurers people who've seen parts of the planet or parts of life or experiences that other people can only dream to see or experience those are the podcasts that are the most fun to create for me and i'm sure those are the podcasts that are the most fun to consume for you this is a special two part conversation with captain sid chakravarti they say that two thirds of our planet consists of water bodies and there's very few people who've explored that vast two third of the earth's surface and sid chakravarti is one of those people both these parts have a lot of stories about the ocean about his perspectives this part in particular will highlight his time in antarctica his journey why he began this life and of course a lot of stuff about fish about the animals out there in the oceans the issues that the oceans are facing right now and a lot of other adventurous conversation trust me you guys are going to enjoy this one for more conversations like this make sure you follow the ranveer show on spotify we're a spotify exclusive now which means that every episode is available on spotify 48 hours before it's available anywhere else in the world this is part 1 of a special conversation with captain sid chakravarti Captain Sid Chakravarti, welcome to the Runvi Show. Thanks, Runvi. I'm happy to be here. Uh, we've been told that don't do no Bollywood podcasts. We want real adventures, real life stories. Well, reality can be stranger than fiction, so. <laughs> yeah, uh, the, you know, as a content house, uh, what we enjoy the most is when we get a comment saying, "Yo, this kind of content is not available on Netflix or movies or anything, but it's available on podcasts." You're someone who spent twenty years dealing with the ocean. all its dangers you've gone diving you've seen things that very few human beings have seen you've had an adventurous two decades man i have yeah i mean the first 10 years of my life were working at sea which had its own adventures because obviously you're out at sea for many many months and then over the next last 10 years it's taken a very interesting turns you know four trips to antarctica parts of the oceans where very few people have gone to having helicopters on the ships fast boats Wow. Court cases, chasing criminals. So pirates? there's been a lot of it. Pirates. Um, pirates, as in pirate fishing vessels. Yeah, there's I mean, a lot of that out there as well. In the they oceans. are the modern day pirates, honestly. They are. I mean, these are actually pirates. At least were not institutional. Hmm. We have institutionalized piracy now, which you, happens. You mean well. governments control these institutions? Not government really, but these are proper transnational companies. So you know, they'd be. flagged in Spain they probably have an office in Hong Kong they'd have crew from Peru or Indonesia and they run very sophisticated operations so it's not fly by night mm. piracy that we think about but it's modern day piracy so it's got its own modern manifestations mm. Mm. like you know you read about those manual labor camps in the gulf where uh, people from the interiors of indian villages are told okay go in the gulf you'll earn higher money they do earn like higher amounts of money but at the same time they're undergoing uh, basically manual labor uh and uh, what's the word for it human rights violations are like rampant in the gulf but what people don't know is that human rights violations are rampant in the oceans as well and it's just something that people don't think of a lot people think of the gulf who thinks of the ocean who thinks of the seafood that you're eating you're bengali right I so that's bengali, the other yeah. angle with seafood yeah has your opinion on seafood changed after knowing like you know all the human rights violations that go on in the oceans it has i mean so i when i went out to sea i was at 18 and mm. i was just somebody who was excited by the sea you know you go out there you work you put in many hours i used to work on merchant ships and it was a whole different life and then i started working for sea shepherd which is a conservation organization and started seeing things that usually one doesn't get to see even if you're working at sea and that's the workers who are on these fishing boats um and it's not just my personal observation there's a lot of reporting that has now happened it's one of the least regulated in terms of labor rights etc enforcement and it's also a very dangerous job if you're out at sea for 365 days of the year and in fact some workers are out at sea for 3 4 years and they work 20 hour days low paid work it's dangerous through storms chasing fish is no easy job mm. and so that brought me to a phase in my life where i was vegan for 6 years 
And then I shifted back to India and I started working with fishing communities here. And I saw how fish is primary food for them. And so when I work with them, I've gone to not being vegan again because I've kind of advanced my thinking about what is the ocean? What is food? Mm. But yeah, there's a huge social component, whether that's workers, whether that's communities, all of that at sea, but that doesn't come back to land as much. Mm. What is it that the average person doesn't know at all about the ocean, but you know, and you're like, your people should like know about this. I mean, I think since we were talking about workers, who works for four years continuously, every single day of the week for 20 hours a week mm. on a fishing boat that let's say runs out 100 kilometers of line and 100 kilometers is like I've driven 100 kilometers to be on your shore right so that's the kind of fishing gear that a fishing boat is laying out every day mm. there's 10 people on those boats and it doesn't come back so it leaves a port let's say in Taiwan and it's in the middle of the Pacific catching tuna and it doesn't come back four years from the day it's left and that's immensely industrial and out of people's realities, right? Like we think about people migrating from Bihar or UP and coming to work in the hospitality industry or construction industry. We think about people going to the Gulf, but they're still on land, not to say conditions should be compared. But, you know, just being out at sea on a boat floating in the middle of the ocean for four years, I think that's pretty intense. Not a lot of people know that that's mm. the kind of work that is taken to catch fish that we find on our supermarket shelves. Mm. Is it true that the ocean is running out of fish that you can eat? It is. I mean, so let's say a very short history in the way the oceans exist today is the last hundred years. So Japanese American expansion after World War One, World War Two was the first kind of global expansion into the oceans. Before that, most countries didn't think about the oceans beyond like six kilometers or five kilometers for sure. Technology didn't exist. Staple diets, which go back a few thousand years at least, didn't really require fish that were further apart from there. But that's where we went. And then you've had World War II, you've had Spain coming out. And since 90s, at least, when you know we India entered liberalization, it's been China, which has been happening, this global expansion. And what has meant in that is that the oceans have always been a space for profitability. So you, the further you go from land, you meet a newer species, you fish that out, you go a little bit further out, you meet a newer species. So the amount of fossil fuel and the amount of distance that fishing boats are spending has almost doubled in the last 50 years alone. So that's an indication that we are expending a lot more energy to catch the same fish. And then you have species change. So, you know, I think urban consumers might think about palm thread, surmai as being our mainstay species. But you speak to anybody who lives on the coast and has a staple hmm. fish diet. Fish that were available 20, 30 years ago no longer exist. And that's the second indication. This is people's lived everyday experience. Those fish don't exist. So in that sense, we're landing the same amount of fish. But fish that was edible, that was healthy, that was megafauna, you know, big fish. We're not finding those. What we find are more, what they say, trash fish. That fish gets, that gets ground up and fed to fish that have been grown on land. So it's like fish is feeding fish to feed humans as opposed to fish feeding humans directly. Mm. So in that sense, there's a lot that has changed in the ocean composition and it's not a rosy picture for sure. Mm. Like when you say it's not a rosy picture, where are we heading? Like say in 2030, what are beaches? What is the ocean going to look like according to you? If we keep going this way. So the oceans of course are like not just fish, right? Like the oceans have marine life you've also now got an infiltration of plastic. So there's a there's a friend filmmaker called Chris Jordan, who's done this beautiful film called Albatross. And he just went on this atoll, which is like a coral reef uh, in the middle of the Pacific. And he filmed albatrosses over one cycle. And there are albatrosses who are not being able to take off from the beach. When they are born, they get born on the beach and they go over to the windward side, they spread their wings and then they take off with the wing and then they fly for the rest of their lives coming back to the island that they were born on. And they're not being able to take off. They've got so much plastic in their belly because as the adults are flying over the ocean, they are picking up blue things, pink things, white things that resemble reef fish, but it's actually plastic. And this is in the middle of nowhere in the middle of the Pacific. So that's a big concern. Mm. Uh, in fact, on one of my campaigns in Antarctica, uh, there's this world's deepest fishery. Like it, they catch fish at about a kilometer under the surface. So we did a plastic dissection on some of the fish there on one of our campaigns. And we found plastic there as well. <laughs> so it's a massive concern. Uh, pollution, of course. I mean, we're speaking from Bombay. And pretty much the 
10, 12 kilometers of the coast of Bombay. It's just industrial and everyday waste that goes out, whether it's from the pumping stations, whether it's from, you know, the Thane Belapur industrial belt, chemicals, etc. going out. So there's, obviously, it's like a sink for dumping waste. It's like a cheap, disposal site essentially mm. um, and that's not really going well then you've got the fishing sector obviously that's got this global reach that's wiping out very important species and then you've got the very real threat of climate change now where there's acidification which means coral reefs are dying you've got w ocean warming which means ocean currents are changing they're either weakening or strengthening depending on where they are which means big uh, you know, keystone species, as they say, like whales, for example, these migrate massive distances. They are massive regenerators of ocean health. There's a drastic impact on their lives as well. Numbers, reproductive rates are dropping, migratory patterns are changing. So the entire chemistry of what happens in the ocean is also shifting underway. Mm. And I think it's important to kind of register that for a moment rather than just it being a factual thing. Because that essentially is like the largest ecosystem on this planet, right? Like yeah. we call it a blue planet yeah. for a reason. Yeah. Also, is it is it true that only 5% of the oceans are explored? That's what you read a lot on the internet. I say that a lot. Is that actually true? Because considering that you've gone all over the ocean, you've had so many adventures. Uh, do you think that's true? That 95% of water bodies actually, we don't even know what's down there. We don't know how many sea monsters, for lack of a better word, might be down there. So it's interesting in this idea of the oceans as being an unexplored space, because when I went out to sea as well, I used to think on this is on a cargo ship, right? A cargo ship, let's say, from Brazil to Singapore, you cross the Atlantic Ocean, you round South Africa, you cross the Indian Ocean and you reach the Singapore Straits, you will barely see five, six ships through a 40 day journey. And so wow. for you, it exists as a wild space. But then when I started doing fishing work, and, you know, looking at data, satellite patterns, looking at, you know, what researchers have been talking. Actually, there's very little of the surface of the earth that is untouched. It's all out there being fished. There's expansion that's happening. Even places like Antarctica, it's sold to us as, you know, this continent without humanity. But there's a lot going on there. There's a geopolitical race to mine Antarctica there's a treaty in place which is up for renewal, but still, you know, there's a lot that's happening. The Arctic used to be a place, but now you've got all the big oil corporations up there trying to drill. You've got Russia, you know, trying to capture the shipping routes over to China as the ice is melting. So I feel like the moment the opportunity presents itself, the oceans become a place to let's go explore, let's see what profitability can come from there. But depth-wise, yes, we know mm. very little of what's happening because... An ocean on average is about three, four kilometers deep. That's a lot of water, right? A normal swimming pool is like 10 feet. This is a lot more than that. It's it's thousands of times of that. And we don't really know what lives much in the lower layers. Have you seen anything crazy when you're diving, which probably Discovery Channel or Nat Geo hasn't documented? No, I mean, I'm, a, I'm, an, I'm an amateur diver in the sense that I dive, but only on regular air mix, which means you're restricted to 40 meters of depth. So I see a lot of what a lot of other people who perhaps are privileged enough to dive can see. But a good way to look, to, to, to kind of experience what is at the ocean of the bottom came with me with one of my campaigns in Antarctica, which is I was on a ship that, that, that I was captaining. And that ship now holds the world record for the world's longest illegal fishing gear haul. So we were on a campaign, a boat, a pirate fishing boat, dumped its fishing gear and we picked up 75 kilometers of that fishing gear. And pretty much it was set on the ocean bottom about eight, nine hundred meters deep. And so we pulled that net up and it came with everything that exists on the ocean bottom. So on the deck of the ship, we had these corals that people hadn't seen. We saw like stones that have probably existed for millennia on the bottom. <laughs> um, we saw like different kinds of fish that haven't existed. And so in that sense, it was exploration, but not of the exploration kind. But, you know, that's what it gives an insight into just how industrial the oceans as a space mm. can be as well. Mm. On any of your dives or, you know, when you're in like far away from land, uh, have you been in any kind of danger because of uh, sea animals? Like because of like fish or sharks or whales? There's these campaigns that we used to run and the campaigns used to pick up illegal fishing gear. So what usually happens is that the oceans are very unregulated spaces. And so if you show up as, a, as an activist organization the boats usually dump their gear and run. 
And as activists, we wanted to collect that as evidence, but also it's wrong to show up and have this gear and not pick it up. So we've had to pick up fishing gear very often. And I've had a crew member who, while picking up the fishing gear, had her finger chomped on by a shark that was alive. Um, we've run over fishing gear and the propeller of the ship got completely entangled. So in these heavy seas, had to send two divers down to kind of like cut fishing gear from this giant propeller. Um, you know, we've... we've what what we've, do you mean heavy seas? Like where there's waves, obviously, and if the ship isn't moving, you're just like constantly moving. So okay. it's very dangerous for the divers to be down there doing these kind of things. We've had helicopters lost in like ice blizzards because the communication completely got shut off. Rough weather can very often be really risky as well. But with animals themselves, I think it's telling that we perceive animals as being risky, but animals left to themselves aren't really a risk to humans. I mean, if you're out there in the water trying to do something silly in their habitat, I mean, I'm sure it's risky, but on a ship, generally, you're on a ship, they are in the water, unless there's an encounter, like I said, that happens with like either a net or something, it doesn't really get risky like that. Hmm. What about the other animals, <laughs> the, the human beings? Have you had dangerous encounters in the far ocean? Because if you're an activist, you're going away from land where there's a lack of governance, there's a lack of security. Uh, I'm sure some of those vessels carry guns. I'm sure some of those vessels will carry some sort of weapons. Yeah. Have you had situations like that? So very often when we used to plan our campaigns with Sea Shepherd, uh, there'd be people who we'd seek advice from. Like, okay, you've been a professional fisherman for 40 years. Can you like advise us on X, Y, Z? And one of the first responses we'd get, like, you're going to get shot. It's not a safe place to just go out and do these things. And we've had a few encounters, like we've had ship collisions, we've had things thrown at us, we've had projectiles thrown at us. When we used to do these uh, anti-whaling campaigns, the Japanese Coast Guard used to be on board, so we'd get like sonic booms in our ears to like try and deafen us. What does that feel like? Uh, I mean, it momentarily stuns you, that's what it is. Like, it, it's a riot control gear, it's not really a deterrent as such. So then we learned like very heavy, your protection probably like reduces the stunning. We've had like water poured down our propel, like our engine funnel to try and stall the ship so that you can't keep up with them while they continue whaling and things like that. So there's all of those encounters. Then we followed criminals back to courts, not literally, but through paperwork and through the Interpol and the police and things like that. And then there are those encounters which happen where you're in a courtroom with somebody who's been at sea with you your ships have been really close to each other and then you know you're giving testimony and they are stewing there they, you are under police protection so when when we had gone for to, you know you get like police protection and things like that so things in that sense always have had risk what we've always said is that uh, cameras do act up as countering guns in a way because what we were doing was taking an audience with us out there so people who did campaigns before us obviously faced a lot more risk. But by the time I went out, at least we were carrying an audience with us. And so I think the guns never really came out. But violence as such existed in terms of like aggression, trying to get us off our tails, you know, put the engines down, things like that. Why does whaling even happen in the modern day? Like what is whale meat or whale bodies used for? Because I know it anciently used to be used to make <coughs> soap and things like that in medieval times but the modern day why do you want to kill whales i mean with so much environmental uh knowledge out there why are whales still killed so the, i i used to have the same question right like why whaling and that's when i was really a part of these anti-whaling campaigns whaling has a complex history and i think it's important um to kind of reckon with that because it's not just medieval times like whaling america for example or the dutch or the australians used to whale well right until the middle of the 20th century. Um, in fact, some of the biggest massacres have happened by their ships. Um, and it was largely for blubber. In fact, blubber fueled the civil war and actually allowed for the Confederates, a you know, big kind of advantage over the traders, etc. Blubber is like whale fat. Blubber is whale fat, yeah. So essentially, it used to be burnt in turbines. It used to act as a lubricant for machinery. Uh, it used to be a very prized cargo. So ships used to go out and really, like there are accounts from the 16th, 17th, 18th century where people would say that they would have to stop their ship for four, four, five, five days for a pod of whales to go by. Mm -hmm. And today, literally, you are like two whales, oh, it's a pod of whales that we saw, like that's how much. But that happened in that century. 
Today, whaling happens largely in Norway, um, in Iceland, and with the Jap Japanese whaling fleet. There's a bit of artisanal whaling that happens. Solomon Islands, some of these islanders also harpoon whales very locally. But that kind of industrial whaling only happens by these three countries. And at least in Norway and Iceland, it's very primarily for meat, for consumption. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's eaten. And Japan's is a different issue. It's, it's tied up with World War II. When Hiroshima and Nagasaki were bombed, a lot of the land was completely irradiated. And so Japan's foray into Antarctica was largely to bring back meat for uh, a post-World War population. Um, that has kind of changed to a situation where it's looked upon as American imperialism to not, you know, consume whale meat. It's also tied up with territories. As I mentioned earlier, Antarctica is like this big grab for territory. And so Japan's there, China's there, Australia's there, America's there. And there's a whole lot of that. The truth is that in those kind of semi-diplomatic, semi-masculine geopolitics, it's the whales that are paying the price because there's about a thousand whales that get harpooned every year. Mm. They get taken back. It's a hugely subsidized program. There's not much that happens with that whale meat. It's not used in anything. It gets put into uh, lunch meals for kids um, and, and not much more beyond that. So it's pretty, it's not needed really. So it's just an ego battle thing. It's an ego battle. One's got historical kind of whaling that it hasn't acknowledged, let's say America. Thousands of thousands of whales killed for fueling its colonial expansion. Hmm. And then you've got Japan, which comes from a very different place of whaling, which was, you know, you've bombed the hell out of us. We're trying to rebuild our country. And somehow it has become these two kind of narratives with white conservation on one side and, you know, Asian racism and anti-racism sentiments on the other side. Hmm. But as I said, in the middle of that... It's the whales that still get harpooned and taken back, yeah. Mm, you know, but you the can... conversation could be a lot broader than it actually is at the moment, which what, is... What do you mean? I mean, I think we don't very often talk about whaling like this, do we? We very often talk about those Japanese whalers, and that's <laughs> the end of the conversation. Mm. Um, I wish we could actually, as activists, as conservationists, sit down and have more complex conversations, because these are complex issues. They've got historical, they've got emotions entangled with it. Mm. It's, it's easy to lose logic when you are very emotionally charged about something mm. and I think if we could have less charged conversations about this I'm sure that'd be something that can change have you seen any whaling in front of you have you seen it happen I haven't seen whaling but I remember in 2012 uh, we had this helicopter that had gone out and got a call on the satellite radio because the helicopter had gone about 150 60 kilometers away from the ship and I got a call and they had just pulled up three whales onto the whaling ship. So there were three dead whales that had just been harpooned. How, how, how did they actually kill them? Like, what is the process of killing a whale, which is so big? So there's two methods. The first method is a harpoon. So it's a harpoon, harpoon with a dynamite that gets shot in. So it essentially pierces the whale and it explodes inside of it. And then a hook opens up and that's what they bring it into oh closer. And if it's a good shot to the head and all, it, it doesn't suffer for too long. But if it does, one of the approved techniques is to sh kill it with a shotgun. So then they put a gun over the side and they sh put bullets into it till it dies. So those are the two ways to do it. Okay. Anyway, go on. You were saying. No, so I mean, I haven't seen whaling happening in front of me. But I've been on campaigns where we've seen whaling happening. Maybe one of the other ships has seen it because we used to go as a team of two, three ships. Seen these dead whales for sure on board the ship and stuff like that. And it's a very close encounter with them. What was going on in your head when you kind of had that close encounter? Like, do you, do you hear the whale make a sound? Or, you know, what, what's it like being near a whale? So the interesting thing is I've seen a lot of whales alive as well. And that's one of the beauties of being in Antarctica, right? Like it's summer... Whales have migrated down and they generally migrate with their babies. So they've gone up to the tropics, they've mated over there. There's a calf that has had mother's milk and they've made this long journey down. And you see them in that, you know, like I said, 24 hours of light in the middle of the ice. And you see them like that. And then in comparison, you see them dead. And at least for me, my personal reaction is to not let it affect me. And I think that was part of my role as being a campaign leader, as being a captain, as being in charge of people who would break down seeing that. Um, and it's similar with other species as well, because I've seen lots of fish dead. This one campaign in Antarctica, as I said, we picked up 50,000 kilos of fish from the ocean floor. They were all rotting. 
So like literally you see these giant tooth fish. They might not be whales, but for me, they similarly, I think every life counts in, in the fact that it's just not there. It started affecting me later. I think a few years after going through photographs, you realize that, you know, you've just become numb to it in the moment. But there's something about that that I like even now when I'm speaking to you, I feel very deeply about it in the sense of there's something about that life being taken out in front of you in a manner that seems purposeless. Mm. Like I, you know, I work with fishing communities and I see fish being caught all the time. I say it to you and I feel differently saying it. But I think in that setting, thousands of miles from land, a fishing gear or a whaling harpoon that shouldn't really be there, but is there for very different reasons. Either it's profitability, either it's geopolitics, either it's history, either it's ego. And that purpose doesn't make sense for that killing. And I think that's what really started affecting me later. Not so much the death of it, but the fact that it had died for something that for me didn't make sense. Um what is it like seeing a whale that's alive? Like, have you seen a blue whale? I have. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> where did, where was this? Um, so I've seen a blue whale. I've seen a fin whale. I've seen a humpback whale. I've seen a minke whale. So these are the four big baleen whale species, which means that they eat crustaceans. They don't have teeth. And then I've seen sperm whales and beaked whales and lots of dolphins, which are on the toothed whale, which is it, means they have teeth. Is it scary to see something that big? I would say it's similar to seeing an elephant. I think it's more their size and their grace in their supposedly ungraceful dimensions, right? Like you don't look at an elephant and say this animal is graceful, but yet you see it move and there's not a sound that comes. Or you go to up to a rescued elephant and it'll take that watermelon or whatever in the lightest of touch. I think whales are like that as well. You think about them as being these big... 10,000 kilo animals and you'd think like they splash and all. No, they just glide through mm. water. They can be silent. You know, on mornings when it's really calm and some days we'd just be drifting. So you shut off the engine and you're just killing time. And you can hear their breaths, you know, whoosh, coming out. And if you catch them like on a good sunny day, you can even see the vapor coming out. of. The so, you know, you see that and you actually see the magic of, let's say, evolution or life. Like in that setting, just to be there as a witness to it. Do you feel the intelligence? Like you say, if you're diving with them and they're near you. Because the first time I ever went diving and I've spoken about this on the show yeah. as well. I saw a whale on my first dive. And I remember the grace. I couldn't articulate it till this point, but that's exactly what I felt. Yeah, super There's grace. grace in the movement. But I also felt intelligence. Yeah. Have you felt something like that? I mean, I have a very different take on intelligence. I read this book about octopus. And recently, there's been a Netflix film about octopus mm. as well. This guy who goes out in South Africa and swims with them. Yeah, my, my octopus friend. Yeah, yeah my octopus friend. But, you know, octopi have evolved completely different to how humanity has. Um, so, I think when we look, let's say we changing gears, we think about a dog. We say oh, a dog is an intelligent animal because it interacts with us. I think a whale is an interactive animal. And that's why we have a relationship with a whale, especially like what you're experienced. I've done it as well in Tonga, you know, went there in the summers and Tonga, which is a country in the South Pacific, is a huge whale breeding ground. So whales, after they finish their eating in Antarctica, make this 5,000 nautical mile journey. It's about 8,000 kilometers to Tonga. And then they're just there in the reefs for three, four months. And they interact with you, right? Like you could be on a kayak, you could be on a free dive, you could be snorkeling on the surface and they'll come up to you. That thing about the whale eye, it's a real thing. They do mm. look at you. And so I think they are superbly interactive as species has that happened to us. To you? It has, yeah. And the whales looked, what do you feel? I mean, I mean it's, it's a magical moment, right? Like I'm just taking a moment to recollect that because I pretty much remember like being under the water and these three humpback whales coming up and one of them like, I saw its eye move as well as it went by. And I know thousands of people have seen whale's eyes. But I think that moment with you or like the, your moment with the whale, I think, yeah, it's, 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 it's so big and it's so <laughs> close. And it's just gliding past you, curiously looking at you or like trying to see who you are. And it's a, yeah, it's, it's fascinating that that experience exists on the world, right? Mm. Like you've got a species that has evolved in the water, has got nothing to do with you. And yet probably it's a one-year-old whale. You don't know it's an old whale that's interacted with humans before. Mm. But somehow it's just like seen you and gone by and, and maybe it's a memory for it and it's a memory for you as well. Yeah. Um, 
So this is a question I've always wanted to ask the government probably, but now that you're here, I'll ask you. Uh, what's out there in the Lakshadweep? Why is it not de- developed for tourists? Is it true that it's more prone to shark attacks or something? Because that's what some urban legends say. Some urban legends say that it's a naval base. Some urban legends say that uh, there's there's too much marine biology there and it should be left like that. And that's for environmental reasons, they've not developed it. But if they do develop it, it will become as good, if not better than the Maldives. And will become sort of a, a revenue generating thing for the Indian government. And some urban legends say that they're actually developing it for tourism in the near future. So what's actually happening in Lakshadweep? That's an interesting subject. I mean, I spoke to a journalist who was doing a story on this and I gave her all that I knew. I mean, I don't know too much, but I'll I'll, I'll say the same to you as well. So Lakshadweep has not been developed. I think for a number of reasons. I think one, its own history with a Muslim population, uh, largely its remoteness from the mainland, Um, its links to Kerala as a trade route and Kerala's own communist history. And there's a lot that has gone very differently, let's say to Lakshwadeep than it has to the Andaman and Nicobar. And the reason for this, I think, I mean, I'm sure there are anthropologists and historians who look at this. I think trade routes from India into Malacca have been a historical trend. We've had trade routes, we've had spice trade, we've had human migration. And therefore, Andaman and Nicobar Islands were always on the path of migrating east. We never migrated west as such. The Muslim traders, the the, the trading that happened in the 16th, 17th centuries, were well, always from the Cape of uh, Good Hope, so from South Africa coming up, which misses the, 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 the Lakshadweep Islands as a space to stop over, or from Somalia, you know, coming around, uh, or from the Persian Gulf, which also misses... Um, So the Lakshwadeep, I think, only came into its existence in the last 30 years, ever since China became this powerhouse of the world, and most shipping containers now pass through the Lakshwadeep towards Europe, etc., on this side. And so I think the Lakshwadeep has just not been on the development landscape, so as to say. Chinese ships stop at Lakshwadeep? They don't pass through, but it's because it's a chain of islands. You've got the six-degree channel, seven-degree channel. They're just major shipping routes. So the ships come out, they round Sri Lanka, and when they're heading for, let's say, the Suez Canal, they go through the Lakshadweep Islands and out there. So that's where the interest for ports now is coming for the Indian government. It can be a transshipment port. You can have containers over there. It's also a coral island ecosystem, so which means natural depths close to land are very good, unlike let's say the entire east coast where depths are not very much uh, and you find it very difficult to build ports for bigger vessels. So I think that's where the interest is now coming from. Tourism, I think in terms of tourism globally, we are at a place where tourism is being looked upon as one of these benign sectors, so to say, in terms of development. So rather than let's say have mining or build a palm oil plantation, let's build tourism where... It's positive. It's positive. Mm. So that's where the tourism interest is coming from. Um, but I mean, to quantify all of these as saying, because of my work with fishing communities, at least in India in the last five, six years now, neither ports nor tourism actually being development to those in the model that they exist today, Mm -hmm. because Maldives like tourism is very, very energy pulling, you know, these islands don't have electricity. So you need to have diesel generators. You need to pull electric lines on coral reefs. Tourists who pay upwards of a lakh, lakh and a half for a trip will not just eat local food. You need to get them good fish. They need an air conditioner. They need to live in nicer houses. So it becomes very energy intensive to have these tourism projects. You don't have roads and boats because people want to travel in and out of holidays. So you have to have planes, which means you have to build runways on coral reefs. Mm. So it doesn't, it's not in sync with what exists over there. So I think we need to quantify that tourism is happening, but what kind of tourism? And at the moment, it's not looking like it's good tourism in the model, but also the way it's happened. We know what's happened with the posting of the new governor, etc., in in the way it's happened. Um, Port, similarly, we've got a port coming up in Little Nicobar. We've got a port coming up in Andaman, uh, in in Port Blair. And sooner sooner or later, I'm sure there'll be ports also coming up in Lakshadweep Island. So I think the interest is always generated in a particular area, depending on where it is in terms of global connectivity. And I think Lakshwadeep was just off the map, but it's come into its mainstream now, and that's where it's happening. And on fishing, which is my area, Lakshwadeep is also a base for a very particular kind of pole and line fishing method, where there's this lovely boat, a local indigenous boat. People sit around the boat with a hook and a line, essentially. 
and they there's somebody who throws feed out as the boat is going to the water and people catch tuna with it and mm. that's very sustainable a lot of maldives does that as well but india's expansion that we were speaking about earlier is not pole and line so much it's about long line which is mechanized capital intensive very destructive because it takes sharks it takes seabirds it takes all kinds of fish because it's essentially a hook with a piece of bait on it and mm. anything that bites it is just stuck on the hook mm. so it's a very non selective at least for a particular kind of species so that's the kind of expansion that's happening there as well so what happens to island economies existing practices cultures when these kind of mainland developments go there is something that we've seen in different places and i fear that it's going to happen the same in lakshadweep as well mm do you think it's going to have a bad impact on the ecology i do think it's going to have a bad impact on the ecology because i feel and that's not just specific to lakshadweep i think we fundamentally have not registered as people but also as policy makers that the ecology is in decline i mean i think we've you spoke about this tree that fell outside you. like you're in a coastal city but not on the coast and you've lost a tree right in front of your house this is the reality of most people who live on the shoreline every year with more intensity with more frequency uh they can see it in the fish disappearing they can see it in the monsoon cycle changing they can see it in the amount of jellyfish that come in you know jellyfish makes fishing absolutely impossible because you get stung your fishing nets get clogged you're seeing it in wind speeds you're seeing it in cyclones when are we going to register that the ecology is a very fundamental part of the economy mm. and plans that don't start from that point of view i think are not setting up anything for the long term it's probably going to run its short course then there's going to be a big cyclone that comes over lakshadweep flattens the resorts i don't know mm. you probably have a lot of non performing assets that come out of it mm. but it's not something that leaves the people with anything to look forward for the next 100 years right like what they need is there's rising sea level they need stilted houses there's the very real frequency of ocean acidification reef destruction where are we looking at that as a central pillar of our development i think that's where it's going to fail for a lot of our development policies mm. wow do you think that the cyclone in bombay happened for a particular reason now because in 28 years of my existence i've never come across anything so intense you're just staring at it like you know what is happening here never seen wind speeds like that my mom went to see what's happening in the balcony she almost flew out yeah and it was it was yeah. intense and we had to like hold her back and i've never seen anything like it but what why is this happening according to you so i'm not a meteorologist but at least from my conversation with fishers and fishers come with a lot of traditional knowledge they probably look at the wind and they'll tell you that this month should not be an eastward blowing wind but it's eastward and there's going to be jellyfish in the water and sure enough next day there'll be jellyfish in the water so there's a lot of confusion that's happening within them as well and that for me is more alarming than let's say a meteorological report but the truth is that ocean temperatures ocean currents and therefore existing wind patterns high pressure low pressure systems are changing and that's making weather systems really unpredictable we've just had the latest ipcc report it's filled with a lot of big terms but very simply put that's what's happening you know ocean currents are shifting oceans are warmer than they were a few decades or a centuries ago that means that the air that is in contact with the water is of a different pattern that means that when it comes close to land just like a southwest monsoons are a high pressure low pressure system wind flows from high pressure to low pressure those pressure differentials are different they're either too extreme or they're too closely packed together and so you have patterns that have not been seen before and that's what's causing cyclones in april in may which are not cyclone months they're not even monsoon months right mm. um and what's happening with that is because coastal resilience has been reduced bombay's coastal road uh the sea the the flyover the sea whatever it's called the sea link sea link um the shivaji statue the reclamation that has happened over the last 100 years whether it's the mayim or kolab or all of that the coastline is no longer able to absorb what it used to with surges that happen in these storms what used to be there on the coastline like coral reefs or something like that to so there's again this idea that every coastline used to have mangroves i mean a lot of our coastline have mangroves but a lot of our coastlines don't they were rocky they were muddy they were clay they had estuarine river ecosystems so they used to absorb shocks in different ways so a rocky outcrop didn't have mangroves because it could withstand mm. and it would always be a cliff or at a height impervious rock that can withstand the sea 
but we've had a loss of all of that so when you build let's say you put tripods on varsova beach the beach just like sand in rivers has an immense capacity to absorb water to absorb that shock and the narrower and the thinner and the lesser those barriers become the more the city gets impacted mm. uh, and 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 mangroves absorb that kind of water sand absorbs that kind of water canals and rivers that are healthy wide enough absorb that canal because the mithi let's say it didn't have a pillar in the middle of it it didn't have bkc's waste going into it a storm surge would have taken it all the way to sanjay gandhi national park it would have swelled the sand would have absorbed the current but that doesn't happen mm. it just overflows into the banks and causes flooding into mm. whatever reduced space it has so coastal resilience is reduced as well and then we've got urbanization i mean big buildings coming up on the coastline big infrastructure coming up on the coastline these imp- these are not meant to be there but somehow we believe that the wonder of technology can keep up with so and there's that battle man's greed for money because every time you're building a big building you're also selling flats yeah. you're also possibly going through some form of money laundering in that process so at the end of the day it's the chase for money that's destroying ecology but yeah chase for money and interestingly of course money is one big part of it but what are we doing we're taking funds that are meant to be for the public and channeling it into very private lives for example what could have been a, a a a transit corridor for trains has become a ceiling a majority of the people don't use cars right let one driver and one person is going to nariman point to work every day so we've also taken funds that could have helped the public at large with good infrastructure and fueled it into very narrow interests where the number of people who benefit from it is less but the people who get impacted by it is more mm. the fishers at worli let's say being a perfect example you know they got their you know the haji ali worli bay that's yeah. entirely now taken over mm. so the fishers there it's a very rich ecosystem in fact a few years ago with our friends we had started something called marine life of mumbai which was just to take people out on spring tide days into the intertidal zones get off the road and walk into the ocean because the tide really recedes mm. and on those days you see how alive this city's coast in spite of everything is you know we run a whole instagram page it's fascinating and all of that is gone which means people who live there are gone so i think there's also that which we really need to be concerned about mm. because yeah no no go on no it's just that 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 shift of bad infrastructure that takes from public funds and gives to to a few private hands it's a very in equal unequal kind of policy making that's happening right and we need to be more concerned about it mm. i have a burning question in my head that's been burning for a bit now you yeah, mentioned sure. antarctica yeah so you've you've gone you've lived there you've traveled around uh what's that land like like what is crazy about it what do you see uh you know what are the experiences like how cold does it get <laughs> all all these questions like just talk about it yeah um So I've been very fortunate. I've been down to Antarctica four years in a row between 2011 and 2015, um, because it's in the southern hemisphere. December is our winters, but it's their summers. So I've gone down in the summers. The reason for those four visits was on conservation campaigns. Two were whaling-related campaigns. Two were fishing-related campaigns. And so that was the primary motive to go down on these old 50-year-old ships with a volunteer crew. and go hunting for pirate ships and operations and fly helicopters and chase them and pick up their gear so it was not just like a visit to antarctica it was also a very unique visit to antarctica because a lot of people get the chance to let's say go on holidays to antarctica so you leave you get onto a ship or you get onto a flight you fly you go to one of the bases you go see the penguins but this was literally experiencing antarctica in all its elements um pushing through ice standing right next to towering icebergs sending people to dive under icebergs and you know catching underwater life how how do people go diving down there i mean is the gear like warmer or something yeah so usually if you dive in warmer waters you wear something known as a wet suit which is just an insulation but doesn't keep the water out when you dive in cold water it's something known as a dry suit which means it's completely sealed you wear a lot of warm clothes inside and then you go your diving time is much lesser as well i mean it mm. still causes a lot of numbness and things like that mm. yeah and 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 saw the beauty on one side like fascinating landscapes the most in december it's usually 24 hours of light in antarctica so you will literally see the sun like just go around it never <laughs> rises and sink and so you have like orange <laughs> you have like beautiful 
sunrises and sunsets in the sense that it's just long twilights. So the orange is like five hours. <laughs> then it's sunny. Then it's again orange for five hours going down. Then in January, February, it starts getting dark for two hours, three hours. So you start seeing the southern lights, which is essentially the Earth's magnetism mm. pulls light and it dances. You know, people know the north, northern lights. So you have the southern lights. It's known as the Aurora Australis, which is the southern lights. So there's a lot of that that you see. You're with a bunch of people who are from all across the world, all genders, all sexual orientations, just living on a ship, trying to make it through. If we had to extend our campaign, we'd be like, we have to switch off the heaters. So you're literally sitting in your room, like your breath, like coming out of your mouth, completely vaporizing in the room because the generator is just taking too much fuel. So you switch it off. So we've done things like that. Helicopters on board, like flying the helicopter 100 nautical miles from the ship. It was a tiny ship. I remember once this naval pilot came and he said, how do you land and take off a helicopter from this thing? It was completely designed by one of the crew members. There's a And, and yeah, so, you know, it was like pushing the limits of design, endurance, skill as well. Like we very often think about people as being skilled because they've got a degree. But I think intention also builds a lot of skill in people. And the intention was something's wrong, we got to solve it. Mm. We got to intervene. Jugad. Jugad. And yeah, total Jugad. In fact, Jugad reminds me, I built a fishing gear here of Wadala and shipped it to New Zealand and that went to Antarctica on a <laughs> ship as well just to pick up fishing gear. Wow. So Jugad was definitely something that we did. What's the apex predator in Antarctica? Like in those ecosystems? I'm guessing orcas. Are they there? Orcas are there. So Antarctica is so unique because it doesn't have, it's known as a mixed ecosystem. So unlike a triangle that we think about where there's one species and it controls the whole ecosystem, it's very mixed. And the reason it's mixed is because of the ice that recedes and freezes. So when it freezes, that continent becomes bigger. And in the summers, when the ice melts, the continent kind of shrinks because you've got water, the ice becoming water. So what happens is in that warming, a lot of lower species move up oh. and a lot of tropical species move down. Okay. So in the southern summers, you'd say that the orca eats seals and toothfish and it's an apex predator. But when it's not there, that same toothfish is the apex predator of the deep seas. Toothfish. Because it's, toothfish it's, it's like a shark? It's actually a big fatty fish that is like no other fish, but it's got teeth and it's a predator of the deep seas. Is it, can it harm human beings? Not really. It, it can't harm human beings because it's very slow moving, slow maturity. But the interesting thing is it's the world's most expensive fish. To eat. To eat. Have so you eaten it? I haven't eaten it. Okay. But I, I I think two five-star hotels in Bombay serve it. I think Hakasan serves it and then some other place. But yeah, it's like two and a half thousand rupees, a, a small fillet of fish to eat. It retails for like quite a bit of money. Just and because it's fished from Antarctica. What do you think it tastes like? It's meant to be really fatty and almost like salmony. In the oh, sense okay. that it's that white flesh that separates easily. Mm. So perhaps looks good with like beans and, and <laughs> what people eat that with. But probably really fancy. I don't know, dude. Like I've always kind of been a little bit afraid of the ocean. Like it's always scared me, you know. Right. I've gone diving uh, in Seychelles. I've like, I've, I've had some experiences with it. I love the beach. But there's just something that scares the shit out of me when it comes to the ocean. And then when I think of Antarctica, just as... A place on earth that scares me because it's at the edge of earth pretty yeah, much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, is there any scary aspects to being there? Like, you know, does the weather get scary? Why am I scared? Or kill off my fear, Captain Sid. <laughs> like, what? Why is it scary? I mean, I think the ocean is scary because it's been it's been told to us in history as a scary, dark place, right? Like, we've got the Kraken, which is like mm. this big monster that exists over there. Do you think it exists? Um... I mean, I, I don't think so because we know we know big squids exist, which are kraken-like. And we know that because now we study sperm whales and we know sperm whales go a kilometer or a mile under the sea. Hmm. They catch one of these big things and they very often come to the surface and, you know, a tentacle of the big squid is hanging out of its mouth or it's <laughs> in its poop, you know, remains of an octopus. <laughs> or I've seen footage in fishing gear where they are picking up this toothfish fishing gear. And there's a giant squid just attached to the net coming up. How big is it? Like how big is the, when you say giant? Uh, I mean, it, it, it it's about 10 to 11 feet. Um, so the head would be like the size of my torso. Hmm. Just the head 
of a usual squid, the head's that much. So, and then the tentacles are about 10 feet, so across the length of an average room. There's also something called a colossal squid, right? Yeah, colossal squid. Which is even bigger. Which is bigger. And, you know, we've got now these remains of what these megafauna used to be. So we have this trend of animals becoming smaller. Mm. You know, there are accounts of tunas weighing 600 kilos. Which, <laughs> and, and, you know, being 11 feet high. Mm. You don't find fish like that anymore. The mm. species exists, but it's no longer growing to that size. Mm. So there's, there's a whole change that is happening of that sort as well. But Antarctica can be scary because of its weather and its remoteness. You know, so we used to go down on ships that were really old, that were not meant to be in the ice. So we've got stuck in ice. There's a time when I was a novice, like the first summer, and I misread the ice charts, and we got stuck in ice for three days. And the ship was not meant to be in ice. So we literally like... You mean, break- when, when you say stuck in ice, you mean like ice formed around the ship? Like what? Ice, you- so... Uh, so, I mean, just to give a little bit of the... So, so there's these... There's a Ross Sea in Antarctica, which is a big whaling ground. And the Ross Sea has a current system that's clockwise. And so the ice comes in and Ross Sea freezes over in the winters. But in the summer, it starts melting. But it starts melting with the current. So slowly the ice goes out of it. It doesn't suddenly empty out. And you, the way you read ice charts is that the satellite captures an image, like an infrared image. And then it shows you white and black. Black is open water, white is the ice. But it shifts very quickly or it it's not very accurate if there's heavy cloud cover and all, which is very common. So I decided to cut into the Ross Sea, thinking it was an open patch. And slowly the ice got thicker and thicker and thicker and then we were just in ice. And because the ice is shifting, you feel like, oh, I should just take a turn and go back out. But it doesn't happen like that. Mm. So we got stuck in this ice. And it's not like it freezes over, but it's just like the ice becomes so thick and so big and so like mm. hard to get out of. That you're pretty much like just stuck there until something starts moving. And then we started pushing through the ice. And we had this helicopter that was on the front and it was flying with its light on. And it was like every time it would say go right, there's a little bit of open water, it would like tilt. So we'd be like, okay, we have to go right. Then it would, because he could see from the height what he was seeing. And we had people in the hull of the ship, which was underwater. Literally standing and telling us, oh, the 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 like the metal is like bending with like hitting into the ice and stuff like that. God. So those are like scary moments for sure. What the fuck, man? <laughs> <laughs> we had Hans Dalal on the show. Uh, we speak a lot about animals to Hans Dalal. And he told me that when a tiger looks you in the eye, it feels like it's scanning your soul. And I've had that experience. Uh, unfortunately, in a sort of zoo, not a zoo. Yeah. But they have this thing called Van Vihar in Bhopal, which they, mm-hmm. where they've turned like sort of this small sanctuary into like an artificial zoo but the carnivores are inside cages but you get to see a tiger super up close like right. a, a tiger that's probably born and raised in the wild but now they've kept it in captivity and you feel like it's looking into your soul and i just feel like some higher animals for the lack of a better word have that ability to know what's going on inside you in the same way that dogs smell yeah, your hormones yeah, and yeah. they know what you're feeling yeah. i feel like some of these elephants or whales for that matter when they look at you, it's like they're scanning you. Scanning a bit. you, yeah, for sure. It does seem like you feel like there's something behind that look. There's something going on within them. Mm. Yeah, for sure. Which is which is what uh, troubles me about the concept of whaling, right? Like these animals probably go up to those fishing vessels out of their own curiosity. Ki. They're thinking that hey, what's what's up there? What's up there? And they go straight like into they swim into their own death. Unfortunately. That, unfortunately, I mean, just to allay that fear, because actually whales have picked up that these kind of propellers and speeds and frequency mean a harpoon is coming. Because whales communicate a lot with each other. For example, uh, Dr. Roger Payne, who I've had the absolute joy of meeting, he's the first one who discovered the songs of the humpback whales. In fact, he even released an LP that's mm. called Songs of the Humpback Whales. And there's literally communication that happens about migratory routes, about dangers, about, you know, storms. And there's patterns that they repeat. Each pod has its unique language and song that they communicate. So whales, they've actually realized, communicate that harpoon ships are coming. So they perhaps won't run away from my ship because the propeller sounds different. But they would run away from a whaling ship that's coming up to it. So that is something. But we've just... And and that the purposelessness that I was talking about. I mean, I used to work on ships, right? And I have a deep love for ship engineering, like nautical engineering. But when I saw whaling harpoon ships and their engineering, it awed me and then it disgusted me. 
because it has come out of a space where it turns on a dime it accelerates it no time its center of buoyancy is designed in a way that it can chase ships in a particular weather and so every engineer sat down and said how do we design a ship that can kill a whale mm. i think that's the kind of purposelessness of killing that really blows my mind that it exists today mm. and the whales unfortunately are completely outdone because what happens is when they first hear it they dive the whalers wait it starts tiring it can't it in its running and it's diving so ultimately it's just on the surface as a slower whale and that's when it gets harpooned so it's literally chasing down and killing this happens all over the world it's not just the japanese whalers even though we have the most prolific footage of them but the norwegians do the same thing the icelandic do the same thing so yeah it's 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 engineered a ship to kill a whale they go after one whale at a time so usually the fleet goes out and they can only harpoon one whale okay but they usually harpoon one whale and tie it to the side its dead body is floating and then they'll kill another one and tie it to the other side so two or three at one time they can bring back mm. but not more than that because it's also a huge weight on the side of the ship once it's mm. killed you can't really have them for that long and these are all those whales that you spoke about it could be a blue whale it could be a sperm whale it could be anything or the specific species so between let's say 1850s when whaling started in antarctica and about 1954 that 100 year period 13 lakh whales were killed in antarctica alone that's 1.3 million whales so the blue whale species which is the biggest whale i mean they are bigger than dinosaurs as well that's the biggest animal that has ever lived and still lives was nearly entirely wiped out just to give an example um, i don't know how people understand sizes but i understand sizes it's the size of a average best bus an average full size bus 29000 of them were killed in the year 1928 in one summer alone that's the amount of whaling that used to happen so they are not allowed to be hunted there's an international agreement that blue whales can't be hunted fin whales also can't be hunted in antarctica humpback whales can't be as well so the japanese whaling program is only now minke whales they used to have a small fin whale quota but they no longer do the norwegian and the icelandic in fact they do fin most of they they mostly harpoon fin whales and they do it within their waters there's like jurisdictions at sea as well so no international agreement actually applies in their waters so it's different but yeah blue whales are off and humpback whales are too much of a tourism draw because you know they have big pectoral fins and they usually drive the whaling industry i mean the tourism industry but fin whales and minke whales which are the top two are the ones that get targeted mostly what about orcas killer whales like uh, where do they uh, kind of land in the spectrum are they also targeted no killer whales have an entirely different fate which is aquariums and parks mm. i mean sea world is born out of orcas being able to do trade right and that's mm. a horrible horrible fate to meet as well have you heard about those orcas that killed their trainers because they go crazy Yeah. Yeah, do you want to enlighten the listeners on that from the you know mouth of a marine biologist I'd rather have you explain it than myself. I mean I'm I'm not a marine biologist but I I do know that you know orcas like I said blue whales are on the baleen side orca orcas are at the top of the chain on the toothed side. So you know they are of the whale species but they are a cousin of the whale species and uh, they are highly mobile highly evolved highly pack animals that move multiple like they cross continents in packs they people have seen videos but if they haven't you know they they found ways to swim in stealth catch seals of the beach toss them into the air like they play with their food when they want to teach their young they'll they'll catch a seal but they'll go and put it back on the stone and the seal yeah. is confused so the mother will then tell the cub how to like yeah. catch it so they, they train the children in hunting and they have generational hunting techniques which yeah. one generation passes down to the next generation yeah. that's the intelligence of that yeah. animal so there's oral tradition as we say you know you, let's say fishing communities have oral tradition these are animals that have oral traditions as well it's not written anywhere what happens with the sea world trade is essentially that for aquariums and performance shows one or two individuals of these packs get taken into uh used to be now you can only breed them in captivity wild orcas can't be caught and the public sentiment around it is changing but essentially you've taken an animal that's a very social animal a highly migratory animal a animal that requires the open ocean for its full life 
and put it into a tank that is not much bigger than this room it's the equivalent of taking a human being and putting it into a, a solitary cage, confinement yeah, essentially which is like which will make your hands and your legs stick to yeah, each other yeah. it's that's the equivalent so all you, its life yeah and so you have behaviors where whales then end up just banging their head all the time or they just go back and forth their teeth begin to rot completely they for many many months they keep making that sound that they make for finding their pack if they get lost out at sea it's a long distance sound that allows it to so you know they are looking for their family their pod out there and that's been denied so i think sea world and aquariums have been a horrible experience for orcas luckily the public sentiment around it is changing i just hope countries like india china which were also floating these ideas don't end up having them because you know it's something that america europe did and it's no longer yeah. something that's in vogue i don't think we should pick that up and bring it here yeah i actually think one of the good outcomes of covid other than the environment kind of picking up again is that people started sort of disliking zoos and things like sea world uh, i don't know why that's happened but i've seen it happen it might just be gen you know what gen z is like people born after 1998 or called yeah. gen z yeah um they are super environmentally conscious as compared to the previous generation so maybe they're spreading the awareness but there is a certain amount of hate that's developed towards zoos which is a good thing according to me zoos of any kind yeah yeah and yet we've heard the good news about the penguins giving birth i think bombay zoo has given there's been mm. penguins and there's mm. and and i don't know i mean i think that's a complex complex situation for me because i know i'm sitting here with a lot of privilege saying i went for four trips to antarctica what does the average person who didn't have a training at sea who was not upper caste male like me who didn't have the, how do you make those connections i think documentaries and storytelling podcasts like these i think that communication is changing that and i think zoos will also be a thing of the past yeah for for sure and especially in their current formats i think caged animals as a learning technique i don't i don't think they have much value mm. but i think until we can get people information in more accessible publicly funded vernacular languages and connect them with what's out there in our world i think maybe zoos do play some role i'm not sure what role that is but there is some role that they hey, can play you mean as a young people end up falling in love with animals because of zoos and then eventually may become conservationists i mean i don't think anybody has everybody has to become conservationists in my view but i think it i mean like the whales i right it built something for you and me when we saw it what if somebody had a chance to see like a brown bear and feel something about the karnataka humpy landscape where the brown bear lives mm. maybe it builds something in them they are from karnataka migrant living in the city you know people chance on some encounter and it changes them mm. and maybe a zoo at some point a well kept zoo an open zoo a zoo that is designed for the animal mm. not that the animal is confined to it which is why we need <laughs> virtual reality captain sadat probably yeah like uh, i mean i actually think that that's just one of the problems that virtual reality will solve and virtual reality is on its way honestly so how would you imagine virtual reality doing For, first of all i think that there are virtual reality devices which are extremely expensive and it's a matter of time say around two decades i anticipate right might be shorter than that because who knew that phones will become yeah, so advanced yeah. by 2010 yeah like i remember when my dad got a a uh, touch screen phone for the first time in 2005 i thought that was crazy i was like oh a phone you can touch yeah. and now it's like every everyone's phones are touch screen yeah, phone yeah it's matter of 15 years yeah. so who knows what the next 15 years will hold but i feel like once virtual reality becomes affordable uh reality is going to move into the metaverse right so say instead of captain said coming down to my office in mumbai you can have a virtual reality pod in nasik why do i need you here in person yeah. i need you yeah. here to see your body movements while you're talking to me to see how you look right but that can actually happen virtually one day right yeah. now it can't yeah. so it will actually solve a lot of the problems that human beings face it will create new industries it will solve problems like this and life as we know it is going to get divided into the life you live in virtual reality mm -hmm. and the life you live for the sake of your health because your body will still be yours yeah so these will be the two industries most industries will move to virtual reality but the industry of health will be here that's what i anticipate so yeah that's <laughs> <laughs> that's what i think so that was part 1 of this lovely conversation with captain said trust me part 2 gets even better do not miss out on that remember to follow trs on spotify 
with Spotify exclusive, which means that every episode is available on Spotify 48 hours before it's available anywhere else in the world. In part two, we're talking about everything from the supposed sea monsters to the geopolitics of oceans to some of the most beautiful places that Captain Sid has visited. You guys are going to enjoy that one as much as this one. Until next time, guys, from Ranbir and the team. Namaste. See you later.